All right. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church of Norristown. Bright, sunny, slightly chilly morning. But here we are, here to lift our hearts and praise God. Praise God. Every, every Sunday morning, every week, uh, we come to this place, and we are very fortunate to have this place. Um, the first song we're going to be doing today is Reckless Love. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good. took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me.
continue on with Great Are You, Lord.
allow us to continue to use the gifts that you have given us as we lift our hearts to you and serve you, all of us in this church, First Baptist Church of Norristown. Look upon us, your children, as we look upon each other, continue to make our greatest efforts to love ourselves and one another. Give us the power to stay strong as we prepare to move into the Lenten season. You are our shepherd, Lord. We look to you. and We are your children. We'll continue to carry out the word of your eternal grace and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Let's pray all together. We're going to set a call of worship. Ten number 28. Come, let us pray the Lord with our inmost being. Let us not forget all of his benefits. He heals our diseases. He satisfies our desires with good things. Through Christ, let us continually offer a sacrifice to praise our God, that is, the fruit of the lips that confess his name. Do not neglect to do good, to share with what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. That's Hebrews 13, 15 through 16. You can also give online at our website, fbcnorstown.org, by clicking the link, Tides and Offerings. You can also place your monetary gift in the offering plates by the doors on either side of the sanctuary. And now I'd like to pray for the offerings. Dear Lord, we give our thanks to you for all that you give to us. Please accept these offerings as a small token of our thanks. Please guide us to use them wisely and in your name. Amen. You're all welcome in the house of our Lord, and we are delighted that you are here today. If you're a guest today, we would ask that you fill out a green card located in the back of the chair facing you. Simply fill out as much information as you are comfortable doing and drop it in one of the offering plates located outside the entrance and exit doors. And now we have some connection points. So we have the World Vision. Today is our World Vision monthly offering, which helps us to support three children who have benefited from your generous giving over the years. Donation envelopes are located by the entrance and the exit doors of the sanctuary. Thank you for your continued support. This week at FBC, we have the Youth Group, Wednesday, the 23rd at 7 p.m. Men's Bible Study, that's Thursday, the 24th at 7. And I think the women have something in the works as well. Um, okay, and then He, Me, We Club, that's Saturday, the 26th at 10.30. And then I think Pastor CG has some things to go over. Thank you all. God bless. Well, welcome to First Baptist Church in Norristown. As Becky mentioned, I just wanted to go over a couple of a uh, couple of announcements that are coming up. Um, one that I'm really excited for, you can see up on the screen here, is our Tails and Ginger Ales. And uh, it's happening on March 2nd from 6 to 8 p.m. Come on down, have dinner with us. We're going to have soup right out here. And uh, we're gonna, I think we're going to have some sign-ups so we can make sure we have enough food for everybody. But what I'm really excited for is um, the tails part of it. And actually, my friend John Chafee is actually here with us today in the back there. Thank you so much for coming, John. <laughs> and John's going to be uh, sharing with us a bunch of parables that he's been writing. He's actually working on a book as we speak uh, regarding this. And he's, uh, for those that don't know, John is a... A youth or was a youth director not too long ago. He's been in ministry for many, many years. Uh, he and I went to college together. We went to seminary together. Um, he has read many, many more books than me. Went to Princeton. So uh, I, I'll tout, I'll tout for you, man. And and uh, and because uh, I know he wouldn't. And so I'm just really excited to be able to share um, the time with him. And he's going to be bringing the stories that he's written and sharing it alongside you all and getting your thoughts on it. What, what did you learn from, from these stories? And they're very fantastical stories. And so I, I encourage the whole family to come out. It's, it's gonna be a lot of fun for, both, for all generations. So we hope you can join us for that on March 2nd, 6 to 8 p.m. Um, the next thing is we are having an Easter egg hunt very, very soon. I'm blanking on the dates right now, but I think it's April 9th. And hey, it's right up there, isn't it? I, didn't even, I couldn't even see it. So yeah, April 9th. Uh, the, the following Saturday will be the rain date for that, and we're going to have a lot of fun. But what's most important is that we need candy uh, donations. We're going to be, I think you can see there's a big old purple bin if you want to start right outside in our Netflix to start uh, depositing that candy, and I promise I won't eat it all. But uh, it'll be, we ask for it to be individually wrapped, no peanuts, uh, just in case for peanut allergies. And next week, uh, Liz and a bunch of people will be meeting in room number one right after church 
to talk about said Easter egg, to make sure we can get all our ducks in a row. I know our Christian Ed subgroup, a lot of people on council have been working on it and stuff like that, but we want to make sure we are all on the same page. So I believe Liz is leading that meeting right after church next Sunday. Uh, as we mentioned, our young adult small group is uh, in the works March 6th through April 24th, every single Sunday after church from 12 to 2 p.m. We're having lunch. We're going to have child care provided. We're still in need of people to provide lunch, to provide child care. There is a sign up there. You could just sign up for one day or just one part of, aspect of that, and we would greatly appreciate it. Our young adults and our young family would greatly appreciate that. It's every single uh, Sunday except for like two of those, but you'll see it when you look at the sign-up sheet. Um, next week, also at the same time, we're just packed out here uh, these, these next couple of weeks. It's just a busy Lenten season, and we are doing what's, yes, I like that clap. Yes, praise God for that. Uh, we're doing what's called a next steps class, okay? This is for people that might not know who we are uh, vision, vision, envisioning for our church. Who, if they want to get to know me, um, if you want to get to know other people, the staff, I'm going to be talking to Drew and Gary, both our new worship director and our new children and youth director as well, to be able to contribute to that meeting. It's a light lunch that our worship subgroup is providing for you all. So this is a chance for you to get to know who we are as a church, uh, kind of our government, our church government and everything like that. So I know a lot of people are here that have, might be visiting or might be new to our church. This is a perfect opportunity for you to get to know us, okay? So if you have other questions, let us know. Uh, Diney and Jocelyn, there is a sign-up sheet for that? Oh, thank you, yes. Okay, so we need that, that sign-up sheet. Jocelyn was able to provide for both the Tails and Ginger Ales and also this Next Steps. So we wanna make sure we have enough. So please sign up, let us know. Is that everything, Rob and Isaac? I think that's everything. Okay, then why don't I invite the children on up for our children's blessing? For those new to our church, we, we try to bless our children right before they go to their kids' church. So you guys can come on up. <laughs> all right, let's all extend out our hands to the congregation. And congregation, I encourage you to extend out your arms and hands and let us receive our blessing. Dear Lord, thank you so much for the day that you've given us. We thank you for uh, the emergency uh, people in our lives, the emergency service. We think of our EMTs. Think of our firefighters. We think of the police that were even just here not too long ago to help us out. We want to bless them and be able to entrust upon them when we might feel scared or alone. Thank you so much for them. And thank you for all the protectors here in our church that continue to bless us. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. You guys can go on out to Kids Church. Oh, to Mr. Gene. You know it's going to be good. Last time you guys got bow and arrow, so I'm a little nervous of what they're getting this time. Oh my gosh. Not katanas. Oh my gosh. <laughs> we come now time to our, pra our praises and our prayer requests. We encourage you. We are praying church. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day that you've given us, even in the midst of the turmoil and the craziness of this world, as was mentioned. You are still the rock and the foundation of our lives. We ask for continued guidance along that path. We ask that we not stray from it, that we not go down anything too sandy or too bumpy in our lives. And you keep us straight on the path of, of, a, of a solid foundation found only through your son, Jesus Christ, who continues to bless us each and every day. We pray for those that are hurting right now. We pray for those that are emotionally, mentally, or physically unstable right now, on unsolid ground. We ask that you bring them back onto a firm hold in their health. We ask for blessings on, on the entire families that are experiencing COVID and that are no longer having COVID, Lord. We thank you for that. We think of uh, just the good health uh, of those that are in need of that right now. We lift those, uh, those doctors and nurses up that can continue to help them, especially when they feel like they don't know what's wrong with them. That is such a, a, a tough feeling, Lord, to just being unhealthy and not knowing what the cause or the remedy is. And so we ask for clarity in all of those situations. We think of those that are persecuted far away 
in the Ukraine. We think of those who are getting ready for a surgery right now. Be with them, Lord. We pray for those that are experiencing school and how hard school can be, Lord. And we pray for those that have suffered sudden losses. For we can only do it through the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, who saved us from sin, who rose from the dead in the, in the praises of that, of that rock that was rolled away, Lord. We are so thankful for your Son who has given his all so that we can give our all back to you. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, well, we're finishing up our series today on the body, and uh, it's been going very well. I appreciate all of you who've been, who've been talking to me about how, uh, how they've experienced this, uh, these sermons and these messages and what they've gleaned from it. So let me hear from you all. What did we learn last week? Does anybody remember? Yes, we have all our own gifts and all our own uh, balances that we need. Yes. Thank you, Tiny. Anyone else remember anything from last week? We're all created different and, and with a purpose to fulfill from God. And today we're going to end our series on the body as we come to learn together. And let's say this together. We are at home in our bodies created by God. He has called every body to come home. When I was finishing up this series, when I was going through the, the, the past couple of weeks, my, doing my own research and doing my own studies and devotions, I was like, well, am I repeating myself too much? I, I, I try not to, but I was like, well, I'll look through my sermons. I'll look through kind of like the titles, the themes, and just like, what have I, what have I been preaching on a lot? And <laughs> the, a word that keeps coming up uh, that came up a lot in those sermon series was, or sermons was purpose. Um, we all need to find a purpose in our lives. And, and I was like, wow, this is, that resonates with a lot of what we're doing with this ser sermons, uh, sermon series on the body. It's why we come to church, right? We, we often come to church because we want to find some kind of purpose in our lives. Like, are we still doing the right thing in our lives? Let's come to church. Maybe we'll find out. Maybe the pastor will say some, but th something. Maybe the band will be able to sing a song that really resonates. Maybe those prayers will be answered in those prayer request time. And we've talked a lot about our physical bodies in the series and how God has created it for us. And we talked a lot on how we can honor God with it. <clears throat> it often comes back to that word of purpose. Our body can do amazing things, as we said. If you ask an atheist why they exist, they would say, well, their bodies are made to, to eat, to drink, to procreate, and, and to learn. You know, that's, that's the basics of, it, of everything. And this kind of becomes a vicious cycle uh, of what our bodies can only do, is that what people will think. When we, but when we apply a grander purpose in our lives. We can, we can do so much more than just those four things. So with that said, let's finish up our series on the, on the body, because I think a lot of that will come out as we talk today. <clears throat> One of the most moving motion pictures for me that I've seen is Mr. Holland's Opus. Has anybody seen that movie before? Came out like 20 some years ago. I know, I'm dating myself, I'm sure. Um, but it tracks a, a 30, year, uh, 30 years of a man's life as he raises a family and he teaches uh, high school music. And so of course that, that resonated with me because I, I almost became a music teacher. I almost went to, to college for that. So I was like loving this movie when I first saw it. But he goes beyond <clears throat> just instructing his student. He, he pours his whole entire life into them. And as the story unfolds, we discover that he took the teaching job because he couldn't make a living just writing music and performing his own music. So this dream of composing the perfect symphony <clears throat> was put on the back burner of his life because of the more pressing matters. But it was always there, right? Vibrating just beneath the surface, waiting and hoping. And then came the day when the music program was completely axed at the high school because of financial cutbacks. Thank God I, that didn't happen to me in my own school, but I've heard of students that have gone through that where their music program was totally 
uh, destroyed. So as he struggles with being put aside by the entire school board, after so many years, after 30 years of service, Mr. Holland, he's left questioning whether his life has mattered at all. He, he put his, his dreams on hold to take up the daily goal of trying to impact the lives of teenagers through music. Now that too is gone in his life. In the scene that we're gonna, that we're gonna see right now, Mr. Holland, he goes to his old classroom and for the, for the very last time. It's near the end of the movie. And the weight of the world is just on his shoulders when Bill, the football coach, drops by to see how he's doing. And I apologize now for those that are on Zoom. You won't be able to see, uh, unfortunately, since we're streaming it straight from Disney+. Plus. So, But you can hear everything. And like I said, you have Mr. Holland who's talking to his best friend, the coach. That's really the only setup that you can. And just imagine two people in a classroom. Let's take a look. straps in the rent cycle down in the locker room. Let's see if you needed any help. Nope. Nope, nope, nope. So you decided what you're going to do yet? Too old to start a rock band. Probably hang out a shingle and teach a few piano lessons. I'd love to retire. I'd... I'm not retiring, Bill. I'm getting dumped. And I don't think you have anything to worry about. The day they cut the football budget in this state, well, now, that will be the end of Western civilization as we know it. I'll tell you the truth. I'm scared to death. They have no idea how much they're going to miss you around here. You really think so? What, do you doubt it? Well, as a matter of fact, yeah. It's almost funny. I got dragged into this gig kicking and screaming, and now it's the only thing I want to do. And You work your whole life. You work for 30 years because you think that what you do makes a difference. You think it matters to people. Then you wake up one morning and you find out, well, no, you've, you've made a little error there. You are expendable. Oh, God. So do you ever feel that way? I mean, deep down when it's, when it's quiet, maybe everybody's in bed except for you. Maybe you're on the road making sure you're paying attention to the road, but thinking. You start thinking about where your life is headed. What you've done. Where you've been. Maybe what you haven't done. Do you ever pause and add up what, when the, what, what your life amounts to and, well, you come up short? Or maybe you just... You feel like a rat in a cage. You're just turning that big wheel over and over and over again. Life is on this treadmill of the same old, same old. You're working hard, but it doesn't feel like you're getting anywhere in life. You feel underappreciated, overlooked, underpaid, or even unnecessary. These are many versions of what Mr. Holland was going through at that moment. It seems to me that most people who, who take the time to reflect on their lives, they struggle with these incomplete feelings and these dead-end thoughts in their life. Some people wrestle with them every single day. And if you take stock of your life and you say, what difference does my life make? Does anybody really know or does anybody really care about me? Then I think... If you're struggling with that or you're thinking that, I think you're in the right place today.
because we're going to look at that. God has a word for you in Psalm 139, and he wants to show you a different picture in your life. He wants to give you a view from the top to help you see the meaning of your life and his perspective so that you can come to terms and love yourself. There's four specific truths that, if believed, are guaranteed to replace the pity parties with purposeful pursuits in your life as we learn the true value of our investment in others. <clears throat> so I encourage you right now to open up your Bible to Psalms 139, verses 1 to 18. I'll be looking at the New International Version. You can see it on the screen behind me, or um, you can pull out your Bible, your phone, or your, your uh, tablet, and I'll wait for an amen when you got it. Amen. amen. <clears throat> amen. Great. Let's look at the first six verses. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, or excuse me, before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me. To attain. So the first thing is, I want you to know is that God knows you. In these opening six verses, there are eight different Hebrew words that stack up to tell you that God knows your story intimately. Each of these words conveys a different layer of God's knowledge of you. Combined, they, they picture God, kind of like a detective, I, I imagine, tracking even our most mundane activities, studying us even when we think what, that we're alone. He dissects our inner world into parts, discerning what, what makes us tick, why we do what we do, and why our mind and our body responds to specific outcomes. He's penetrated past our best foot forward. He has such a grasp of each one of us uh, on, a, on a programming level that he knows precisely what you will say or what you will do next as if it has already been uttered or, or performed, all the while still giving us the free will to choose. So God knows your heart, your, your fears, your thoughts, your motives, your dreams, and even your frustrations. He knows your past, present, and future. He understands you. He noticed what's going on around you, to you, inside of you. He gets you. In fact, God has you down better than you do. And that kind of sounds unnerving, I know, but you can be sure about this. God knows you, but he loves you still. And when David, our author today, says that God has laid his hand upon him, uh, he's referring, and I love this, he's referring to this Old Testament practice of bestowing a blessing on somebody. Uh, you know, a wise father would, would place his hands on his children and then speak words into their lives about who they are and what they're going to be and what they are expected to be. And that's a little intimidating for a child to hear, I know, but we, they need to understand what their, what their place in the family meant at that time, what their future is going to be. God is doing that to you today. This is one of the most important acts that happened in, a Jewish, in Jewish families. And in some way, the same way, your heavenly father, who knows you, bestows blessings upon you, born out of love that marks your place in his family and what your future is all about. The second truth is that God pursues you. When David affirmed God's thorough knowledge of himself, he concluded in verse 6 
uh, by saying, you can see it right down there at the end, uh, that, that it was too lofty for me to attain, as he says. And that's kind of a nice way of saying, well, I just can't deal with this. <laughs> it's just too overwhelming. It's just out of my reach. David's first instinct might be the same as yours. How can I escape? How can I get out of here? <laughs> Where can I hide? If he knows all about that, oh my gosh, he knows I'm a hypocrite. He knows all the bad stuff about me. He knows, he's heard my lies. He saw what I did last week. Let's look at verses 7 to 12 on that. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. <clears throat> David's fear of total exposure moved him to ponder if there was some kind of retreat, or whether it's geographically moving away or spiritually moving away, to which he could secret himself away from God. But God will not let him or you or me run away. You ever run away from your problems before? Yeah? Yeah. Did that solve them? <laughs> Probably not. And if they did, it might have only been temporary. He tracks my path, that David says here, but not to point out what's wrong or to exact justice from me. He's determined to give me grace, to be involved in my life. And that's, that's what David's saying in verses 9 and 10. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. You know what this means, don't you? You are wanted by God. No matter who you are, what you might look like, or what you've done to bring yourself to a place of fear. Over and over in the Bible, we see this affirmed. We are called God's beloved, chosen, dearly loved children. We are told that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. When, when you feel the crushing weight of that loneliness and wonder if you would be missed if you were gone, as we just talked about the suicides in our life, I want you to remember this, that God pursues you. This reminds me of a story that may, maybe you heard before. Marianne Bird writes that when she was growing up, she knew she was different. And I hated it, she said. I was born with a cleft palate, and when I started school, my classmates made it clear to me how I looked to others. A little girl with a misshapen lip, a crooked nose, lopsided teeth, and garbled speech. When schoolmates asked what happened to your lip, I would tell them that I had fallen, I'd gotten cut on a piece of glass, and Somehow this was more acceptable to have suffered an accident to have been born this way, to have been born different. I was convinced that no one outside my family could ever love me. There was, however, a teacher in the second grade who, whom we all adored, Mrs. Leonard by name. She was short, round, happy, a sparkling lady. Annually, we had a hearing test, and Mrs. Leonard would gave the test to everyone in the class. And finally, it was my turn, she says. I knew from past years that as we stood against the door and covered one ear, the teacher sitting at her desk would whisper something and we would have to repeat it back. Things like, the sky is blue, or, or do you have uh, new shoes? I waited there, she said. I waited there for, the, for, the, for those words that God must have put into her mouth, those seven little words that changed my life. Mrs. Leonard said in her whisper, I wish you were my little girl. 
God loves you, friends. God loves you and, he, and me, and he, and he says that now that we belong to him because of our faith in Jesus. We will never be separated again. God knows you, and God wants you. The third thing, God himself made you. Verses 13 to 16 says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. So pay attention to the words here. It was God who knit you together in your mother's womb. A picture of the intricate attention to detail of a seamstress as she creates a garment one thread at a time. And notice that the phrase in verse 13 where David writes, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. The adverbs in that sentence make plain that after God made you, he threw away the mold. You're totally unique. You're one of a kind. You're fashioned with the awe-inspiring skill by the Almighty. Right down to your thumbprint. So this part of our verse, is a, it's, a, it's a common saying among pro-lifers. I see your ears are perking up. Yes, that's a politically charged term, I know. So I ask you to take this moment and pray, prepare your hearts, and be receptive to the full message you know, before getting stuck on the terms pro-life and pro-choice. Let's get into a little bit of my own personal theology And of course, we always know your own personal theology is ever-growing, ever-evolving, and ever-changing. I'll start with this. If if you have to lump me in one of those categories, I guess you could say that I'm pro-life, okay? But honestly, I detest those terms, pro-life, pro-choice. They just create a dichotomy in our world, an us versus them, constantly, That if you're pro-life, you're on the side of good and only and and life only. And if you're pro-choice, you're you're choosing to not save a life. But I bet if you talk to someone who identifies as pro-choice, they would say they are choosing life in the best interest of those who are here and have a voice now. It's what comes natural to a lot of us. I mean, just I said that last week, right? You need to love yourself before you can truly love others. But what gets muddied here in this definition is the, it's the aspect of potential. Potential just kind of gets thrown out the window to those who are experiencing doubt for the wonderful life that's growing inside them. And I say this now to you all, for those who may have experienced an abortion uh, in one way or another, whether it was yourself or a friend or or family member, is that I see you. I hear you, and I care for you. I pray that that decision was was not one of anger. Maybe it was made out of fear of the unknown and not knowing what potential was there inside. Who knows where your heart was at that moment? Only God does. I'm sure it was a long conversation that you had with the Lord Almighty because of that. And I believe children have been saved by grace and are with God now if they've been aborted or even the children who have died before knowing God or not. I have a couple of scriptures that back up this case and maybe you feel the same way. Deuteronomy 139 says, Moreover, your little ones, who you said would become a prey, and your sons, who this day have no knowledge of good or evil, shall enter there, and I will give it to them, and they shall possess it. Also in Matthew 18, 3, Jesus said this, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. 
So if you don't like what you see in the mirror, or, or maybe you feel that the child inside of you was a mistake or a reminder of something wrong in your past, I think you've been maybe taking some cues from today's culture rather than God, who is the incredible artisan who made you and made them for himself. There's no one in history like you. There's no one in history like the child that is inside of you. He gave you a personality, innate abilities, spiritual gifts, and a particular purpose that sets you apart for him. You are his treasured creation, made in his likeness. God knows you, he wants you, and he made you. And if you struggle with the doubts of, of having a child, I'm going to leave my phone number right here. It's also in your bulletin, but if you need to write it down, go right ahead. Who, if you want to talk about this, I'm, I'd love to talk to you all about this. Liz and I, as many of you know, have dealt with uh, the miscarriage of our second child. And we never got to meet him or her. And Liz uh, attests, she says, it was a her, CG, it was a her. And I said, if that's how you feel, like that's how the Spirit leads you. But we do know one thing for sure, is that God holds them now in his arms. Which brings us to our last point. God has plans just for you. Verses 16 to 18 ends with this. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. So David says that the script for your life was already written by God, that the Lord has already carefully mapped out the details that fill in your days, ordaining what will or will not happen. The Hebrew word that David uses here indicates that God has created each day of your life, tailoring circumstances, establishing those boundaries, and fashioning opportunities for his glory and you're good. But God doesn't just set the plan in motion and just look away or walk away. His thoughts are on you constantly. He greets you each morning with fresh mercy and, and new opportunities, ready to go wherever you're going with the hours with you. He loves your company, friends. And he has specific plans that you alone can fulfill with your mind and with your body. He knows you. He pursues you. He made you with a purpose and is ready to live out those plans with you each and every day. Which brings me to uh, this $20 bill that I have. <clears throat> it's a $20 bill, right? If, uh, Cindy, if I offered it to you, you'd take it, right? Yeah, you'd probably take it, right? Well, well what about... What if I were to, you know, ball it up? Maybe throw it on the ground to just step on it. You, do you still want it? Would you still want that $20 bill? Yeah, you'd probably still want that $20 bill. What if I were to, um, you know, kick it or, or tear out it a little bit like that? Would, would you still want it, Jane? You'd probably still want a $20 bill, right? <laughs> She's like, all right, come on. You could still spend it, right? This bill has value because of what it is, not because of how it looks or where it's been on the floor or wherever or what it's been used for. A crisp, clean $20 bill is worth the same amount as this ugly, older, more used $20 bill. You may feel that you've been stepped on and you've been beaten and you've been kicked around. You may feel dirty. You may feel unworthy or useless, friends, but just know this you still amount to something amazing. You matter to God. You need to love thyself to understand that too. Maybe your parents have said words that ring in your ears to this day, or maybe they didn't say the words that you had hoped for and that you were longing to hear. Maybe your spouse has, has rejected you, whether it's verbally, emotionally, or physically. I don't know what's going on in your life, and I'm here to talk about that if you need to. But you need to understand you don't let what another human does 
to define you. Don't draw conclusions, friends, about yourself based on them. You are still worthy. Makaiah, you matter to God so much that he sent his only son for you. You belong. You are cherished. And you are his forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, hmm. I confess that sometimes I forget to remember your faithfulness from the past, especially when I'm overwhelmed with unpredictable things today. Keep reminding me that not only do you see me and know me, but you love me too. I don't know exactly what tomorrow will look like, but I do know who I will be looking to. You, Lord whose love is unfailing and whose hand is the safest place to entrust my hope. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us stand.
Some thoughts might have been said and challenged in your heart today and uh, or maybe these past couple of weeks as we've been talking about this. And I encourage you to wrestle with them. Talk to me if you need to, uh, to continue to process what was said. And no one ever said believing in Jesus was going to be easy. So let's do just that together and talk and learn from each other. Blessings to you, to you and your family today and always. And yes, God knows you and he loves you. Go in peace.